Well, thank you, Rag, for organizing this uh, nice meeting and not uh, such intense uh, pace and with room for discussions. That's actually very nice. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming. So um, I'll give you basically an overview or summary, if you wish, of recent developments. Uh, so part of it is uh, motivated by a recent paper with uh, many authors, uh, Miranda Cheng, Sun Bong, Boris Faging, Francesca Ferrari, Sarah Harrison, and um, Davide Passaro. Um, but it's actually based on many other developments and I'll touch many, many of them in the talk. So here I listed only some of the most relevant uh, developments. And as you can see, the list is uh, pretty big. So I'll try to give a broad picture. And um, many of you know, for example, He Jun Chung. So he has been working on this for many years now. And uh, he could probably give a more technical talk with all the details. And I apologize that I'll be just giving a broad picture. So in fact, I'll start uh, with um, one of the, oh, um, somehow I need to stop sharing and reshare, sorry. I realize that uh, this always happens when I go in and out. So just a second. Yeah, here we go, this should work. So yeah, I'm going to start with um, um, another work uh, by Sangyuk Park, where uh, he, provided a very interesting generalization of a random walk model on um, a diagram of a knot. So the input data is very geometric, it's diagrammatic, but then we're doing some kind of statistical physics, if you wish, or statistical model by rolling the dice. So what did he generalize? So suppose you have a knot diagram, like the one shown on the left, and uh, you're basically a one-dimensional person walking on this diagram. So you don't wanna go all the way to infinity, but you wanna keep yourself uh, in this closed region. And uh, you, every time you come to a crossing, you follow the following rules. If you're going on underpass, you just go through. There is no, for you, no choice to be made. If you come on overpass, then uh, if it's this type of overpass, let's call it left, with a probability one minus T, you divert to lower branch and with probability T you go through. If you're coming on the right overpass, again, over is more important. So with probability T you go through and with probability one minus T inverse, you divert to lower branch. So then, you basically count the number of such closed loops on this uh, graph, the, the planar diagram of a knot. Uh, so for instance, this would be a loop and this big thing would be a loop and so on and so forth. And if you count this uh, closed uh, cycles with arbitrary multiplicity, but condition that they don't touch each other or don't share an edge, you're basically doing the random walk of a fermion. So that's a uh, fermion doesn't want to be in the same place more than once. So uh, such model where you count all such multiplicity, multiple cycles with weight minus one to the uh, length of the cycle times the product of these t's and one minus t's gives you a very simple invariant of a knot known as Alexander polynomial. Now we can easily generalize the same counting to allow cycles to touch each other and throw away the signs. So in physics, we know that minus one signs are uh, typical for fermions. If you remove the signs, and if you remove the condition that you cannot be in, more, in one place more than once, we're talking about bosons. And with the same sort of rules and such simple modifications, you would be counting basically bosonic random walk. It doesn't give you anything new or anything interesting. It contains the same information, and namely it gives you inverse Alexander polynomial, one over the partition function in the previous slide. But in this form, it's actually more interesting because it's related to uh, z uh, zeta function of a graph and various other interesting quantities. So that's where uh, life begins. And this is what uh, Sanyuk Park generalized. So he basically said, uh, taking this rules, so on the left and right, you see the same diagrams for overpasses and underpasses that we saw before, but he uh, introduced this additional ones and the weights which depend on Q so that the whole thing uh, is basically a random walk of a free boson, but with a Q deformation. 
So it's a Q deformation. Uh, and in this question, uh, in, in this uh, context, you can ask the question, what does this compute? So what does this random walk do for us? Well, we know that without Q, it basically computes inverse Alexander polynomial. So whatever it is, it should be associating to a node some kind of Q deformed Alexander, inverse Alexander polynomial. So there'll be two variables, X is for the Alexander polynomial and Q is this new variable that, that he introduced. So that's um, where it starts as a kind of combinatorial or diagrammatic definition of a something attached to a node or more generally to a link. Well, there was a lot of demand for uh, this object. I'm going to call it uh, FK in the rest of this talk. It's, it depends again on these two variables. Q is for the deformation and X is for this Alexander type variable counting the, the random walks. And it turns out that if you take this object and integrate over X with a suitable measure, which is universal, you can actually construct invariants of closed three manifolds. And this fact is uh, quite non-trivial and um, is based uh, at the very basic level uh, on the following theorem due to Likoration Wallace, which says that uh, not theory and theory of three manifolds, low dimensional topology are closely related. Namely, you can construct any three manifold by suitable surgery on knot or link. For example, if you take trefoil knot and perform minus one surgery in the three sphere, or if you take a figure eight knot and perform plus one surgery in the three sphere, you actually get the same three manifold. So the statement of my work with uh, Chipri and Manalesco was that if you feed in this machinery invariants fk of x and q that Sengu computes uh, by this random walking, you actually get invariants of three manifolds. You integrate over x, so the variable x disappears. And what you get is just a collection of q-series invariants uh, that depend on variable q. So they're q-series and they converge in unit disk. Um, and they, of course, depend on the choice of three manifolds. So you start with a knot diagram, then you perform the surgery, and you get the three manifold invariant. So one of our questions was, what, what kind of uh, animal is this? It's, it's, uh, we had certain interest in uh, such objects uh, coming from topology, but uh, they're actually uh, new and rather unexplored. So the rest of my talk is going to be devoted to several surprises about the properties of, uh, of such things, which can be constructed again, very concretely, starting with diagrammatic presentation of knots and three manifolds. So one thing is indeed it's a convergent. It's easy to show that in general, it's converging in unit disk, uh, also has uh, integer powers uh, and integer coefficients. So it looks um, like such an object living in the ring of uh, Q series with integer coefficients. Uh, this should remind you of something, and um, I'm going to come to this something in a second. But before I do this, maybe I should mention that um, for uh, quantum topology, what this object is, it's basically uh, analog of uh, Chern Simons invariant, but not at the root of unity, but rather defined for quantum groups at generic Q inside the unit disk. And um, by now, this technology allows you to compute the sort of invariance for many complicated knots and three manifolds that you obtain from them by surgery procedure. So basically, on every knot up to roughly 10 crossings, you can compute this invariance. And uh, here is an example for 10 crossing knot, some plus five surgery, you get uh, such five such uh, Q series. Again, uh, this is just to show that there are concrete explicit with integer coefficients, and there are this um, fractional powers of Q in front, which again is reminiscent of, of something to which I come in a sec. In physics, um, this sort of partition functions have the following meaning. Uh, they come from 3D, 3D correspondence. And uh, 3D, 3D correspondence associates to a close three manifold or possibly one with boundary, some three dimensional n equals to theory, I'll call it T of M3. And then you can compute various partition functions of this T of M3 and produce a familiar invariance or less familiar invariance of three manifolds. And the object I showed you on the previous slide is one of them. It comes from computing 2D, 3D half index uh, of, of this theory T of M3. So, 
basically this theory, uh, 3dn equals two theory is itself uh, an invariant of a three manifold. And it's not surprising that any invariant or any observable that you ask or any question you can ask about this theory, it also has to be um, invariant. And um, the only interesting thing about this gadget uh, that, that I'm, I'll be discussing in this talk is that it's a very funny partition function. It's a partition function of this 3D theory on manifold with a two-dimensional boundary. So the two-dimensional boundary uh, has to preserve supersymmetry for this partition function to be well-defined. And since we already start with 3D n equals two in a bulk, half BPS condition means that uh, two-dimensional zero two supersymmetry should be preserved on a boundary. And in fact, this is exactly the same uh, sort of context as in the very first talk of this uh, workshop by um, dong Kim. And uh, in his talk, uh, the focus was entirely on a two-dimensional zero two theory that for this setup would live on a boundary. But um, you can actually generalize this notion of elliptic genus to this combined 3D 2D system. And um, this was indeed exactly the perspective that uh, we had with Pavel Putrov and Abhijit Gade when we first introduced this quantity and tried to compute some examples. So uh, again, for physics, it's, it's, it's a funny partition function, which morally is a three-dimensional version of elliptic genus. Now comes the first surprise, which uh, is something that uh, I certainly didn't expect that you compute this quantity for many uh, three manifolds. Uh, as I mentioned before, you can now compute it uh, in um, for many knots uh, and surgeries on knots, uh, zillions of closed three manifolds. And in all cases, you find that uh, this Q series or rather collection of Q series that I showed you happens to be a character of logarithmic conformal field theory or equivalently of logarithmic vertex algebra. I have to say that um, when this happened, which was a few years ago, I had no clue what logarithmic vertex algebra was or conformal field theory. Uh, I've heard of this thing uh, when I was a grad student uh, in 90s, but back then I was told not to pay much attention to logarithmic theories because, well, their correlation functions have logarithms, such theories are non-unitary and uh, often have negative central charges and lots of other pathologies. So I was basically instructed not to waste my time on something that has no role in physics. But, and I'll come back to this in a second, but now it actually, may ring a bell that what I showed you before uh, is an expression in Q, which has exactly the right form to be a character of some uh, conformal field theory of vertex algebra. The overall uh, power of Q is fractional, and that's what we usually call conformal weight of a, I mean, or related to conformal weight of the corresponding module. And this integer coefficients, there is a good reason they're integers, they're basically counting graded dimensions of, of uh, vertex algebra or conformal field theory character. So this conjecture, uh, so again, it, it's being checked in many examples so that this is true and identifying the corresponding VOA is precisely the goal of this talk or the, this, uh, this work that I'll try to review. So question then is given some three manifold, how do you decide uh, which VOA corresponds to it. I don't have the answer to this uh, question, but I'll try to tell you a little bit about uh, this recent developments that, that uh, came as further surprises in this direction. So this connection to log VOAs was, was uh, first of many surprises uh, that emerged. So this conjecture, uh, if true, it implies uh, in particular something about growth of the coefficients uh, an in this expansion of, of this Q series. So uh, whether theory is logarithmic or not, we expect that the co growth of coefficients is controlled by effective central charge. And this is a very specific behavior, which in unitary case is known as a Cardi formula. And uh, here comes another surprise that uh, a priori, I would expect that this uh, effective central charge should depend on a three manifold. And uh, in many examples that uh, were looked at, it seems that growth of these coefficients is consistent uh, with C effective equals to one. So I have no idea why this happens. Just like I have no idea why logarithmic vertex algebra show up in the first place. So like I said, there are many surprises here. And part of my goal in this talk is to offer interesting questions uh, for, for further 
research or discussion. So coming back, let me uh, mention a few things about logarithmic algebras. So it turns out they do have uh, a lot of connection to interesting physics, in fact, uh, real world kind of physics. Um, and uh, one famous example is application to uh, Q-state POTS model. This is a generalization of Ising model where uh, spins are allowed to take Q different values. So if Q is equal to two, namely spin takes two possible values plus minus one, that's the usual Ising model. But when Q goes to one, namely, you basically have one value for a spin. You could argue, well, it's a meaningless lattice system because uh, every spin has only one value, so it should be trivial. And indeed, a uh, central charge uh, of this corresponding CFT or VO goes to zero, indicating that it tries to have no degrees of freedom, but it's actually non-trivial theory. So correlation functions have non-trivial limit as Q goes to one, and this turns out to be related to percolation. Very interesting non-trivial system. Another generalization of Ising model, uh, which is well known as ON model. Again, if N is equal to one, we're talking about O1 model. So O1 is a set of plus minus one. So again, there are two possible values. But this is another sort of generalization where if N is uh, bigger than one, uh, your uh, spin takes values roughly on, on a sphere. But if you send n equals to zero, again, you're trying to get a trivial theory, basically, because O0 is meaningless. But same thing happens. Uh, even though some basic quantities like central charge become trivial, correlation functions are not. And uh, you get logarithmic theory, which describes, in this case, self-avoiding random walk. And uh, there are other applications, uh, logarithmic um, conformal field theories uh, are found uh, in plateaus of quantum hole phase transitions and a variety of other systems. So uh, they did turn out to be quite physical despite uh, what was expected in the beginning. And it is true that logarithmic CFTs have um, negative central charge or in general they're non-unitary. But uh, if you ask the right question, then you actually do get connection to very real physics. So this is what John Cardi did. And uh, in that example of percolation that I mentioned here, he tried to look at the percolation through the looking glass of a logarithmic conformal field theory and predicted a value for one of the exponents. Namely, this is uh, this quantity C is the density of loops uh, um, that uh, have certain area. For example, uh, this density of loops with area greater than A is expected to go as some constant divided by area and constant uh, was measured to be uh, the 0 0.022972. And uh, John did computation using logarithmic CFT and predicted that it should be exactly this number analytically. And uh, as you can see, this is a kind of thing that perfectly agrees with uh, reality. So I wish uh, many of my papers had this sort of perfect match of uh, experiment and, and theory. This is quite, quite nice, quite beautiful. Anyway, so coming back to three manifolds and this uh, Q-series invariance. So uh, what happens is the following. You compute, uh, I mean, what I showed you is a technique to compute this Q-series for many three manifolds, but it gives you an answer as, as a Q-series that you can compute to arbitrary precision, but in order to identify this with a character of some logarithmic vertex algebra, it's useful to have some information about this uh, Q-series. For example, uh, what are the modular properties of this gadget? Or how else can I feed uh, or identify which logarithmic vertex algebra it is? Uh, at a very basic level, uh, for instance, uh, can one write a closed form expression for, for, this, uh, for this mass? Uh, a priori, it just looks like a random Q series, right? So this was the situation a couple of years ago and in a couple of uh, talks that I gave on the subject, I offered even a bottle of wine to anyone who can write a closed form expression, say for this very specific series. So it has coefficients which are 
growing in values. Um, they start like one, two, three, and so on. By the time you reach Q to the 500, they become 15,000 and they keep growing. So this yellow plot uh, showing the amplitude. And as you see, the sign uh, oscillates. So the blue dots uh, show actual values of these coefficients. So they're, they're, they go in various directions. So anyway, various people gave candidates and uh, some people did better than others. For instance, uh, I had a candidate which matches this up to Q to the 20 something. So there were about 20 coefficients which were matched by, by some closed form expression, but then again, it breaks. And uh, very recently, uh, a breakthrough happened, so that's another surprise. And uh, this closed form expression was written uh, as a multi-sum over uh, six integers. Uh, I call them di here, such that it has the form of q to something quadratic in terms of the di's. And the quadratic form is given here in the bottom of the slide. And uh, denominator has the form of uh, binomial, uh, sorry, Kuperheimer symbol for this di's product over all, all possible values. So where did this come from? So this was indeed quite a surprise because many people for a couple of years tried to develop technology, how to write closed form expressions and suddenly this, this came. Well, this came from a completely different line of development, uh, not quiver correspondence, which is something, again, I knew nothing about, I'll be completely honest. So again, I had no intention to go in this direction. Uh, I mean, I've heard of the subject and I like it, but uh, I'm not an expert and I'm not working on it. It's a subject that was introduced uh, in 2017 by this uh, four gentlemen. And as the name suggests, it aims to associate uh, a quiver some combinatorial diagrammatic data to node diagrams. So node diagrams is something I used in the beginning of this talk. So it's perhaps not too surprising that this correspondence may shed some light on, on what we're doing. So what is this correspondence? Um, I actually don't know uh, too many details of it. Again, I'm like many of you, uh, an amateur learning this beautiful subject. Uh, all I can say is that, uh, for instance, uh, the size of the quiver seems to be related to um, some homological invariants. For example, uh, one interesting invariant of, of not is uh, Homfley PT homology um, or super polynomial is its Poincaré polynomial. So in this case for the trefoil, it would have three terms. And uh, that's why quiver has size three for the trefoil. And then the same rule apparently holds in general. So important thing for us will be the adjacency matrix of this quiver, which I'll call C. And that's, that's this matrix. It also encodes wealth of information. And um, diagonal values of this metric zero, two, and three, for example, have to do with uh, homological degrees in this uh, delicate invariant, for example, t to the zero, t to the two, and t cubed are precisely the diagonal values zero, two, three in this matrix, and so on and so forth. So Piotr Sukowski uh, will give uh, a review telling you more about this, this correspondence. Again, I'm just... Uh, a user of, of something that uh, others have developed. And one of the things that, that this uh, many people uh, developed over the years on this correspondence is uh, efficient way of packaging information about knots in terms of generating functions called BPS uh, partition functions or quiver partition functions. So here um, I list, uh, this for, for the case of uh, colored Homfley polynomials. So these are very complicated invariants. And statement is that they're generating a uh, series, uh, which sums all of them with some variable x from zero to infinity can be written in exactly this form, which I showed you on a previous slide where we're summing over several integers, non-negative integers, q to something quadratic divided by uh, this uh, qqdi universal product in the, in the denominator. So again, don't pay too much attention to this form. Uh, in particular, there are various additional variables here, a and x, and again, they're not terribly important. What's important is the general structure. 
So if uh, this is something you see for the first time, you probably should pay attention to this Q to the quadratic thing. Again, for me, this will be the star of the show because it depends on this metric C, which is uh, connectivity metrics for the quiver. And um, the denominator is a completely universal thing. So there is nothing even here that depends on the, on the data of the quiver or, or the knot diagram. So using this uh, technology, uh, recently, uh, Piotr Kucharski, who is a student of, uh, former student of Piotr Sukowski, and uh, later in this uh, paper with many uh, of, of us together, uh, we realized that one can actually associate these quivers to uh, every side of the uh, Newton polygon of the A polynomial of the knot. <clears throat> And uh, quivers are different, and for different sides, you get uh, this uh, invariance precisely uh, of, of, of the type as before. And in fact, the one which is vertical uh, associated to this vertical face of the Newton polygon, there is always such a face. It's called a billion face. Uh, you actually get exactly this invariant that Sanyuk Park constructed using diagrammatic or combinatorial technique. And then by surgery, you can show that you inherit the same form. So this is very cool. Basically, this knot quiver correspondence led to um, a way of rewriting those same uh, partition functions in a very nice, beautiful form where you have some over non-negative integers q to something quadratic divided by this universal denominators. But this is not, uh, again, the last surprise I want to share with you. The last surprise is that uh, this exact same form actually appears in a completely different branch of physics or mathematics. So here is a copy of the paper by Boris Fagan and uh, collaborators, in fact, his son and uh, Ilya Tipunin, where notice that the first theorem in the paper is that they say character of logarithmic vertex algebra, in this case called triplet model, can be written in this form. And look what happens here. It's exactly the same form. It's sum over non-negative integers, Q to something quadratic divided by same things. So uh, we don't even have to do much work. Uh, this is a beautiful thing that uh, very much in style of uh, ancient Greeks, uh, they, they rearranged uh, some shapes uh, to prove Pythagorean theorem. And then the proof was very easy. They, they, they would just uh, tell you, see, that's, that's how it works. So this is the same thing. It's basically screaming at us and saying that for logarithmic vertex algebra is, and in fact, as I'll explain more generally, characters uh, can be written in, in this form. And this is actually not very surprising because this goes back to um, old work of, um, on, on um, conformal field theory and such uh, form, this is called fermionic form. So that's appears in the title of this uh, paper by Fagan. Uh, so the first fermionic form was actually written by Hans Bethe in, in, in his paper. So, uh, and, and this is not an accident because Bethe ansatz played an important role in understanding integrable structures in conformal field theory where uh, quantum groups showed up as uh, more or less for the first time. So people in the 80s were studying integrable lattice models and quantum groups uh, and integrable deformations of conformal field theory. So this is the famous work of brothers Zemolochikovs and then later Fyodor Smirnov and his collaboration with Kolya Rishitihin and others. And um, they noticed uh, this very rich uh, structure in integrable deformations of conformal field theories, which in mathematics literature goes by the name of kajdan lustig correspondence. It basically relates uh, VOA or CFT data on one side and quantum groups and uh, related symmetries on the other side. So in the subject, um, you can show that using this uh, integrable um, structures or quantum group structures, uh, the characters of conformal field theory or vertex algebra would have to be written in this form. So this is again, a reproduction from one of the papers by Barry McCoy and uh, his collaborators. Actually, Barry was uh, one of the first people who, who coined the name fermionic formula or fermionic form of this character because uh, it's uh, expressing the character in terms of the so-called quasi-particles and uh, these quasi-particles are, are fermionic in the simplest uh, 
uh, type of models. So um, Perry and others, uh, so here there are various papers. So this is basically Stony Group, uh, Stony Brook uh, Group. They, they studied bosonization in this context and they wrote um, this fermionic, so-called fermionic expressions in bosonic form and showed that this relates or reproduces Rogers or monogen identities. And uh, this had many connections to various other branches of mathematics, including not surprisingly cluster algebras, of course, because uh, if you look at semi-classical WK B limit of this, you quickly get the logarithms and all these identities, uh, they, they basically have meaning as, as dialogue identities. This is what Edward Frankel, Andra Schenes, um, and others were studying. And um, in particular, Werner Nam um, in uh, 2000s, this was uh, roughly uh, 15 or 20 years later, uh, found connection to um, torsion elements in the block group between this kind of formulae and um, beta ansatz that, uh, again, Barry McCoy and others used. So for this reason, uh, sometimes we hear that these characters are called uh, num sums, but um, it's actually not clear uh, what this term exactly is intending and, and why, whether it should be different from fermionic expressions that Barry McCoy and others introduced or, or the same. But in any case, um, the lesson here is very clear that um, same type of expressions appear in completely different branches or lines of development. So this quiver generating uh, functions that I showed you earlier produce uh, exactly this type of formula where metric C is basically determined determined by the quiver. This is adjacency or connectivity matrix of the quiver. On the other hand, in uh, this old developments going back to 80s or even late 70s, on integrable structures, quantum groups, and conformal film theory, the vertex algebra characters can be written in exactly the same form, where metric C is telling you about how many quasi-particles you have in the system. So this is about this quasi-particle description of integrable deformation of conformal field theory, and again, the work of Zamolochikovs from early 80s and so on. So it's uh, quite nice that from completely different lines of developments, these um, expressions agree. And uh, this allows not only to write this um, topological invariance uh, that, that had that I showed you earlier in terms in a closed form. So this is something that, that would be lovely to have, but this actually provides a clue how to match them with characters of vertex operator algebra, because in this form, this metric C is meaningful also on the CFT or, or VOA side of the story. So uh, this is now beginning of um, basically another uh, turn in, in, in this development and trying to bridge this, uh, these two subjects. Um, although they existed separately and each one had very long or reasonably long history as I tried to quickly review in this talk, uh, bridging this gap or bridging these two subjects uh, clearly will produce many more exciting results. And um, with this advertisement, I think I want to thank you for listening and, and stop here. Thank you very much for the very interesting talk, Sergey.